So we are in Philippians chapter 1, and uh, we're at verse 3 is our starting place. That's where we left off. So as we go verse by verse through the Bible, we come to the next verse. And, you know, one of the most common phrases in Christianity is, I'll pray for you. We've all said it. We've all had it said to us, is I'll pray for you. And that's as it should be, actually. I mean, prayer is very important and vital part of uh, life in Christ. And you think about, uh, when you look at the, the pages of the New Testament, we see that Jesus prayed for his followers. We see the apostles praying for other believers often. I mean, that's what we're going to be studying here in Philippians today, is Paul praying for the Philippian church. And so it's, it's right and good that we should be praying for one another. In James chapter 5, verse 16, uh, exhorts us to pray for one another even for victory over sin. You know, if we are battling some sin that we have, maybe an accountability partner or we share with our spouse or whomever, uh, that concern and someone close to us that we trust and we pray about this area that we're, that we're battling with to experience victory. But often, you know, just as we struggle to know sometimes what to pray in our own lives, we struggle even more to know what to pray in other people's lives, what to, what to pray for for them. Uh, and so today we're going to look at Paul as the example. As Paul is uh, interceding, as we say, he's praying for the Philippians. We see, first of all, that he has the heart of a prayer warrior. We're going to see what that looks like, the heart of a prayer warrior. And secondly, the prayers of a prayer warrior. And we'll see specifically what he was praying uh, for the Philippian church. And so starting with the heart of a prayer warrior, uh, the first thing we're going to see is that he has a thankful Heart. Let's read at verse 3. It says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all, in view of your participata- participation in the gospel from the first day until now. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. And so right there in verse 3, we see that Paul is thankful. He's thanking God for the Philippians. And he's specifically thankful, it said in verse 5, for their participation in the ministry that he was involved in. I mean, the Philippians were a real bright spot in in Paul's ministry. Uh, These were the first converts to Christianity in Europe. We talked about that last time uh, in Macedonia there. They were the first ones in Europe to come to Christ. And uh, I mean, that had to be just so exciting to the Apostle Paul. To think, look how far I am away from Jerusalem, <laughs> you know, and, and people are coming to Christ here in Europe. So that would have been encouraging. Uh, but then, you know, you think about what was going on in Philippi. I mean, it was a spiritually dark place. You might remember from uh, Acts chapter uh, 16 that there was this demon-possessed slave girl there that was going, and her owners would use her to kind of try and tell the future and other people's lives and stuff like this. And Paul, you know, after a while gets irritated with the fact that she keeps walking around behind them and proclaiming, these are the, you know, men of God, listen to them, something like this. And he drives the demon out of her. You know, he commands the demon to come out of her, and she's healed, she's cleansed. But her her owners are angry. And so they have Paul (laughs) arrested for this, Paul and his companion. And so Paul, uh, you know, ends up, Uh, being uh, persecuted, arrested like this, thrown in prison. But even though all that happened, the Philippian church doesn't all scatter. You know, they stay right there. You know, they they are committed to Christ. They don't run away when this happens. And then, of course, we know, I'm going to turn to Acts 16, that God worked a miracle through uh, this whole situation. We all remember the story of the Philippian jailer, probably. We cover that in children's ministry on up. So Acts chapter 16, I'm going to start at verse 25. I'm not going to read everything there, but it is an awesome section of Scripture. So Acts 16, 25 says, But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. 
But Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, Do not harm yourself, we are all here. And he called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him, together with all who were in his house. And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds, and immediately he was baptized. He and all his household... And he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. And so what a miracle that took place there. I mean, this Philippian jailer, now we're kind of concerned why the man wanted to hurt himself like this, kill himself. Well, that was because under Roman law, if you let your prisoner escape, whatever their punishment was to be, that's on you now. And so he's like, oh, I'm not going to let someone else do this. I'm just going to take care of it myself, you know. But thankfully, Paul stopped him. And as a result, he and his family uh, get saved. And so this all happened in Philippi. And we also know that the, the Philippians were faithful supporters of Paul's ministry. I'm going to look at Philippians 4. So back in Philippians chapter 4, verse 15, almost at the end of the book, It says there, uh, Paul wrote this, says, You yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel, after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. And so, you know, Philippi, we talked about, you know, there was some wealth there in that city. I mean, there were gold mines nearby and all this stuff. Well, they took it upon themselves to support Paul and his ministry like this, which is a really cool thing. And so that, too, you know, was something that was a source of joy for him, that they were sharing in that way. Now, he makes it clear elsewhere that God would provide some other way, you know, so he's not trying to put a trip on them or anything like that. But he's just saying, this was so cool that you did this. And, you know, when you're involved in ministry at any level, whether that's in a church or just in your personal life, you have people like the Philippians in your life, I hope. Uh, the, there are some that are not like the Philippians, and you minister to them. And, uh, you know, whatever you're trying to accomplish there, whatever you know, the Lord is leading you in, it just doesn't take. You know, maybe you're trying to help them overcome something in their life or teach them or help them you know, in more practical ways. And for whatever reason, there's no lasting change in that person's life. And it's always sad when that happens. And there are others, you know, in life that we seek to minister to them, and they just flat out reject it. They're like, I'm not receiving from you. <laughs> you know, it's just, no matter what you do, it doesn't matter. You know, they're not going to receive from you. But then there are those that, you know, are like the Philippians, and they take that little bit that you might share with them, and it multiplies in their life. I mean, you see the Spirit really at work in their lives. And you just see more and more good fruit coming out of this person's life. Maybe even years after that, you're not even really that closely involved anymore. But you catch up every now and then, hear all these awesome things that have been happening in their lives, that God's been doing in their lives. And these people will encourage us. You know, that encourages us in our ministry. And this is how the Philippians were in Paul's life. You know, he looks at them, it's like, I just see such awesome stuff going on here. And so the Philippians were, you know, probably easy for Paul to be thankful for because of all the things we've been talking about. But, you know, really to be effective in our prayer for others, we need to be thankful for whomever we're praying, I would suggest to you. Even if they are, you know, one of those harder cases that the Lord sends our way. I mean, for one thing, we can be thankful that God has brought this person into our lives. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. I mean, what does that say about how God thinks about you when he brings someone in like that into your life that's a difficult person to minister to. Uh, someone that's very hard. People have a hard time maybe loving this person in the Lord for, for some reason. I don't know what it is. Someone who maybe has just sort of some, you know, behavioral problems or something like this. And God is saying, you know, I've got this difficult case here, and I'm going to entrust them to this person. I'm going to entrust them to you. I mean, what is that? Isn't that cool what that says about God, how God feels about you? You know, that God would bring a difficult person like that into your sphere of influence for you to love on them and minister to them. 
But, you know, this is still a hard order to fill. You know, I mean, we still have our flesh we battle with and things as believers. And so we wonder, you know, how can I be thankful uh, even if the person is like that, this very difficult person to, to minister to? Well, in order for that to happen, we need what we see next in a prayer warrior's heart, and that is compassion. We need to have compassion. So let's look at verse 7, Philippians 1, 7. Continuing there, it says, For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all, because I have you in my heart. Since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of grace with me. For God is my witness, how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And so we see here that Paul's heart was really with the Philippians. I mean, he really had a heart for them. He has this great compassion for them. And, and compassion is so important when we are praying for other people, that we have compassion for the people we're praying for. Because you think about when we pray for them, we're asking God to move his hand. And, you know, maybe not a coincidence here, a coincidence here, but when we look at the ministry of Jesus, when he moved his hand, we see it was due to his compassion. We see that often. Uh, one example is from Mark chapter 1. I'll, I'll read to you from Mark chapter 1, starting at verse 40. I think this will be a familiar passage. Uh, it says, And a leper came to Jesus, beseeching him and falling on his knees before him, and saying, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Moved with compassion, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. And, you know, not only did Jesus model compassion, but Jesus taught the importance of compassion in ministry. In Matthew uh, chapter 12, verse 7, I won't turn there, but in Matthew 12, verse 7, Jesus told the religious leaders of his day that they did not understand the Old Testament passage that says this, I desire compassion and not a sacrifice. That, that was more important to God that our heart be compassionate than a sacrifice. And you think about how important sacrifices were in the Old Testament law. That had to be mind-blowing to those who heard it. And, you know, this is still a problem, I think, for a lot of us today. We find it easier to do religious works, that is, to do those sacrifices. We don't think of them that way anymore, but I think of doing an act like that than it is to have a compassionate heart for other people. But actually, the compassionate heart is the most important thing. You know, all the works don't mean, you know, a hill of beans if there's no heart in it, you know, if our heart isn't right in what we're doing. Now, we must not, though, at the same time, try to feel our way into obedience. I'm not trying to suggest that, that it's all about feeling in our walk with the Lord. We know that we need to obey God even when it doesn't feel good at the moment to us. You know, we want to still obey Him. But if we're going to be effective in our prayers... We need to pray for compassion for other people, especially those people that we want to, you know, that we're praying for, that we have compassion for them. So that, uh, you know, James 5.16 talks about the effective prayer of a righteous man. We want to have those kind of prayers, those kind of, you know, passionate prayers for those that God puts on our heart to see great changes in their lives, you know, as God is directing well, finally, as we look at the heart of a prayer warrior, I think the last thing we see in our verses today is that they have a pure heart. Let's read verse 9. Philippians 1, 9 says, And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. And so we're going to talk more specifically about what Paul prays for. That's going to be our next point coming up. Uh, but as we look at this, I mean, really all these verses, we see the pure heart of the Apostle Paul towards the Philippians. He's praying really for what is good and right in their lives. And that's what a prayer warrior does. They pray for what's good and right in that other person's life. You know, one measure of our love in this life is this. Do we want what is best for this other person even if it might cost me in the process, even if it might hurt me in the process, do I want really what's best for this other person? I mean, that's what selfless love is, right? That's what selfless love looks like. This is the love that Jesus showed on the cross. 
He was willing to go through that pain for us to give us salvation. And this is the love that good parents, on Father's Day, we're talking about parenting here, right? No, we're not a whole lot, but right here I'll inject that, that good parents show for their children, that they're willing to sacrifice for their, for their children. And parents do make a lot of sacrifices for their children. And their children should remember that. Okay, I'm just joking. My daughter's sitting in the front row. So. Okay. Where was I at in this study? Okay, so. But you think about in a godly marriage, too. Godly husbands and wives. They have that selfless love for one another. They're willing to sacrifice for each other. And this is a love that we see in Paul throughout his ministry. You know, why would he be doing what he's doing? Other than it was selfless love. All the times he was beaten and, and tortured and arrested and all these terrible things that happen. Into his old age, he's enduring this. Ultimately, it goes to his death for the ministry. Uh, why would he do that? And, and, and unless he had that selfless love from God and he was proclaiming the very truth of God, which we know he was. And so this is the heart we must seek as we pray for other people, to have that pure heart. Not praying for things in their lives that will be convenient to us. Or that will benefit us, you know. Uh, I mean, sometimes it may benefit us, right? I'm not saying it never does, but that shouldn't be our goal. You know, we should be praying for what's good for them and their life. Well, next then, let's look at the prayers of this prayer warrior, the Apostle Paul. Because oftentimes, as I said before, when we pray for others, it's a little difficult to know what to pray, isn't it? And sometimes, you know, we just kind of focus on what their wants and their physical needs might be, and it just kind of... Uh, you know, devolves into a list, you know, of things that we, that we pray for these uh, other people. But let's see where Paul focused his prayers. First of all, back in verse 3, in line with a thankful heart, Paul offered thanks. In verse 3, he said, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. And, you know, that goes a long way toward creating the thankful, compassionate heart that we've been talking about that we need in prayer. It's when we just... Thank God in our prayers for this person. Simply offering prayers of thanks for them. And Paul is specific as to what he was thankful for. In verse 5, he talks about their participation in the gospel. That's a good lesson for us too. As we're, as we're thanking the Lord for someone else, that we thank Him as specifically as we can for that person. Lest it just become kind of empty words that roll off the tongue. You know, I mean, it's very easy, especially in our prayers. You know, we, we pray a lot as believers. Praise the Lord. We should be. Pray without ceasing, the Bible tells us. But sometimes it can become a little bit repetitive. You know, and words are coming out, and we're not even thinking about what that word was. <laughs> you know, it just sort of rolls off the tongue. You know, you think about uh, the prayers that oftentimes families have before a meal, you know, with your children and things. And sometimes those prayers almost are just like memorized. You know, it's like, did I really just pray? Or did I just say something? You know, what just happened? And we want to pray meaningfully. And so we want to be thankful as specifically as we can be. Secondly, though, Paul's prayers were also full of faith. Look at verse 6 again. Verse 6 says, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. And isn't that such a comforting verse for us just as believers? To know that about you know this process of sanctification that's happening in our lives. That God is the one who is faithful to complete that work that he's begun. And we take such comfort in that, you know, that God is the one ultimately in charge of our sanctification. We're willing in it. We submit to his work in it. But he's the one guiding it. You know, so he's going to get us there where we all long to be is, is more and more like Jesus. But Paul here, as he was faithful to pray for the Philippians, knew that it was the one to whom he prayed that was the really faithful one. He knew it was God who was the one. He was really the faithful one. He's going to take care of these things. And faith is so important in our prayers. Uh, let me read from James chapter 1. James chapter 1, starting at verse 5. So just past Hebrews is James. If you're turning with me. If you get to first and second Peter, you went too far. James 1, verse 5. And these verses will be familiar to you as well, I'm sure. It says, But if any of you lacks wisdom, 
Let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith, without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. And so, you know, that's kind of a, kind of a hard verse when we read that, because all of us struggle with our doubts, for sure. You know, we're all human beings, so we all struggle with our doubts at times. But it's true that, you know, Hebrews 11.6 tells us without faith, it's impossible to please God. You know, Hebrews 11.6 says that. And so, I mean, what does that all mean? It means that we need to believe that he really cares, and he really hears us, and he really will answer our prayers. At the same time, though, Jesus taught us in Matthew 17.20, and Matthew 17.20 said that we only need a mustard seed of faith, and we can move mountains. Just a mustard seed. Now, so often, we get that backwards in our mind. We think we need this mountain of faith, and then we'll move that little mustard seed. You know, like this little thing we're trying to accomplish. I've got to have this huge faith, and then that'll happen. And Jesus said, no, it's the exact opposite. You need the tiniest amount of faith, and God will do that. And so that's what we need. And so let's not be too hard on ourselves if we struggle at times with doubt. It's a human experience. So let's not be too hard on ourselves if we struggle even having confidence sometimes in prayer, we can pray about that ourselves. Lord, help me. Give me the faith to believe at this moment. I know these things are true intellectually. Help me to feel that, you know, too, as I pray these things. And God can minister to us there. Finally, then, uh, Paul's prayers were spiritual in their focus. Let's read at verse 9, Philippians 1.9 says, And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent, in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. And so the first thing he says there in verse 9 is you know, that their love may abound. And that's a popular sentiment today, really, in our world, is this idea of let love abound. You know, you see phrases along those lines. And when people say that nowadays, they, they basically mean, don't ask questions, don't disagree, just love. You know, don't, 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 get, don't get into details, just love, right? And the thing is that, you know, that's not really what Paul has in mind here. That's not what Paul prayed for. He prayed that their love would abound in real knowledge and discernment. Because, you know, love that doesn't involve our heads is not really love in the end. You know, I mean, we've got to, you know, love with our mind, too, not just, you know, a feeling that we have. Love needs to be discerning, right? Love requires knowledge. I mean, how can you love someone if you don't even know who they are? You know, that's a difficult thing. We can say generally, yeah, I love all the believers in the world, but it's hard to be very, very detailed about that unless you actually know the person, right? That's when we can really say, I have love for this person. I, you know, I know this person. Paul has in mind, though, more than just that kind of, you know, carnal knowledge of actually meeting somebody, that sort of thing. He's talking about spiritual knowledge. He's talking about the knowledge of God. That that's what we need is the knowledge of God and God's ways. And that is what's really going to make us abound in love. As we learn more of God and His love for us, our love then grows, is what happens as believers. The Bible exhorts us, for example, that we should care for the weak and downtrodden. And we see God cares for the weak and downtrodden. The Bible shows us that we're all sinners saved by grace. If we've accepted the Lord as our Savior, we are saved by grace. But all of us are still sinners. And so we can have mercy for other people as they sin. You know, whether it's another believer or not, we think, man, you know, this person is just really getting ripped off, you know, by their flesh or by the enemy here and the sin they're falling into. That doesn't mean there aren't consequences. There are consequences for sin. You know, we have legal system in America. You know, parents have to discipline their children. All these sort of things. There's all kinds of consequences for sin. But it gives us compassion for uh, the ones that are struggling there or, or enslaved even. And love is also discerning. It requires knowledge, but it's also discerning. When love sees a friend or a family member that's making self-destructive choices, 
It discerns what's happening. You know, this is not good for <laughs> what's happening here. This is not good for their lives. And so we look then, we pray for ways that we can help, that we can get involved. We ask for God to move in the situation for this person, that they be put off of that course that's going to lead to a place they don't want to go. Well, Paul further prayed that with that discerning love, the Philippians would then approve uh, what is excellent or discern what is excellent there in verse 10. And this means that we're going to involve ourselves in what God would have us do as we're approving those things that are excellent. And we're going to reject those things that God would not approve of, that God does not approve of. Again, this all comes about through discernment and from knowledge, from knowledge of God's Word. Because it turns out what feels right to us doesn't always end up being what we should approve. You know, there are things that feel right to us and they're wrong. And we find out right afterward and go, oh, that was actually wrong, even though it felt right there for a little bit. <laughs> and now I realize, oops, <laughs> that was a terrible decision. Instead of, you know, basing our lives on what feels right, we need to base our lives on what we know is right from the Scriptures. Those are the things that we approve. And that is difficult for many Christians, I think. I mean, because we do have, you know, by God's work in our lives, we have those compassionate hearts for other people and for the world around us. Uh, You consider, you know, some of the social issues out there and how that is very difficult for Christians to to discern, you know, what, how, should I, how should I look at this? Because this person makes this argument, and I feel for them, you know. But then there's this other side, and I feel for them. <laughs> you know, now, what, what, what's the right thing? You know, which, what way should I look at that? Well, whether someone can convince us this way or that way isn't the issue. We need to look at the Word, don't we? We need to look at God's Word and see the answers that are there that God has for the situation, and then let that inform how we're going to proceed forward in our lives. And so we base our positions in life on any issue and every issue, not on how we might feel, not on a moving story we see on TV or read on the internet, but on God's eternal truth. That's what we have to base our decisions on. And sometimes it doesn't feel good, you know, because God's word is is very clear about things, even though our world wants to muddy them. But we have to land on the side of God's truth. And so Paul's further prayer then is that with that discernment in verse 10, continuing there, they would live a blameless and sincere life. And, you know, that is what happens in the life of a believer. That that is what's going to happen as we submit ourselves to what the Lord is doing. Now, that doesn't mean any believer ever becomes perfect. You know, we have daily proof of that, you know, in our own lives that we're not, per- we're not perfect. You know, stub your toe and, you know, say a word you wish you would have never said, you know, or something like this, you know, happens. And we're all, you know, embarrassed by that and don't want those things, but we struggle. But, you know, when you look at our lives, compared to where they were before we got saved, they've been cleaned up a bit, haven't they? They've been cleaned up a lot. I mean, they've been completely changed, actually, is what happens. And if our life hasn't been changed, then something isn't right. You know, and that, you know, that's something we need to seek counsel. You know, I'm certainly available to anyone who would want to talk about things like that that they're struggling with. But, you know, because we should be. Our lives should be different now than before we gave our life to Jesus. And what happens, the reason our lives are different is because we're continuing to submit ourselves to the Lord's work and to what the, the Scriptures say. And therefore, we let our opinions be formed by the Scriptures instead of trying to take our opinions and force them on the Scriptures, which we see so much of today. We just need to keep ourselves in the Word, don't we? We need to be reading God's Word as often as we can so that it is affecting the way that we look at everything in life. And, you know, as believers, we're still not shielded from hardships in life. I don't think I have to work too hard to convince anyone in this room that Christians deal with hardships in life. But when you look at our lives, as we live them according to God's will, according to what we find in the Bible, uh, our lives are the best that anyone could hope for. I don't mean we're all the richest. I don't mean we're all the healthiest. I don't mean any of that. But they're still the best that anyone could hope for. And polls consistently show that those who live their lives consistent with the conservative 
scruples that are based in the scriptures, they have the happiest lives. They have the happiest lives. Over and over the polls show this. You know, the world tells us that, no, you know, the way to happiness is through sin. We need to unrestrict sin and everyone will be happy. Well, it's not working out. You know, those people who are doing that are the unhappiest people and have the higher rates of suicide and all this sort of terrible stuff because they don't want to submit to God's word. We need to follow what God's word says. I was reading a, an article about this as I was preparing this study. There's so many articles about this, these sort of polls. This one was from 2008 uh, from the Seattle Times. I thought this line was really a good one as he was grappling with why is this, <laughs> you know, that these people who live by conservative values are happy? And he says this, it has something to do with worldview. And, well, yeah, you're right. It has a lot to do with worldview, you know. <laughs> As you follow God's plan for the world, you know, you're going to be a lot happier because that's the way we were designed to work. Uh, and that's all contrary then to, again, what we see so much in our culture on TV and the Internet and all this, all the things that are so popular but are completely contrary to what's really going to bring real happiness uh, in someone's life. Well, finally, Paul's prayer is that the Philippians are empowered by the Lord in all these things I've been talking about. In verse 11, I'll reread it. He says, Having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. The Philippians, like us today, uh, we're not able to live a godly life in the flesh. It's just not possible for us to do that. This power, though, to live that life is, is available to us. We need the power of the Spirit to do that. But the Spirit is available to us. Anyone who's been born again, the Holy Spirit lives in you. And so His power is available to you. And we just need to ask for it. And I, I would say we ask for it daily. That, Lord, give me, give me power to, give me your ability to walk as a godly person in the circumstances I'm going to be in today. We live in such a, a daunting time. I mean, right now, in 2020, I mean, 2020 sounds like such a cool year coming up, right? It's 2020. How could that not be cool, right? It's 2020. We all heard that phrase, 2020 vision, our whole lives. Well, it turned out it was a little bit different, right? <laughs> a little bit different than we all expected. Uh, I mean, there's been a, a global pandemic going on. Uh, there's been uh, protests now in our country and riots actually gone around the, the world even. And there are some who uh, have stated as their purpose that they want to divide and disrupt our nation. And these people are, are active today. I mean, they're infiltrating other groups and causing problems. And so, man, was there ever a time that we need the Holy Spirit in our lives to walk in wisdom in this crazy time we're in? to be those voices of calm and reconciliation in our societies and even having his discernment as to how should I sort through all this and what should I make of all this. Ultimately, we want to be conduits of God's love, don't we, as believers. And that, too, is something we can only do by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so today we've been looking at Paul as one who intercedes for other people, who prays for other people. We've seen the heart of a prayer warrior. We've seen the prayers of this prayer warrior. And, you know, Paul was not unique in this ministry. Uh, you know, the Bible talks about how there are different spiritual gifts, and those spiritual gifts line up with different ministries that we all have, and those are unique to each one of us. But, you know, this ministry is common to all of us. Everyone has the ministry of prayer. That's not something unique to anyone. And as we pray, uh, let's think about these things we see Paul doing. Let's not neglect. You know, pray even for spiritual growth in the life of those who God has put in our path for us to pray for. With that, let's close our time in prayer. Lord Jesus, uh, we're so thankful that you give us such uh, awesome instruction in your word to, just to show us how we should live as believers and how we should even pray for one another. And Lord, we just pray for uh, all of us in this room and all those who are watching this and listening to this that uh, you would fill us with your spirit, that you would empower us even in this difficult year of 2020 to be those conduits of your love, to be discerning, Lord, and to be uh, just your hands and feet in such a difficult time. And we thank you that you will do that, that you answer prayer. And we know this is a prayer that you would have us pray. And we give you all the glory just for everything you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name, 
Amen.